In this video, I want to describe to you vector embeddings. So a lot of what I'm going to describe today will remind you a bit of autoencoders. In fact, autoencoders are the name of the game here, but we're going to use autoencoders for a particular function. So the goal here is to see an efficient and semantic strategy to encode large input spaces. How can we re-represent our inputs into a, a format that's more useful? So we've been using vectors to rep represent inputs and outputs so far. So for example, when we're dealing with MNIST, we'll have a two, we'll represent it as a one hot vector, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So a one in the two space. And they're basically taken from the set of binary vectors. Um, binary strings, I guess, of length 10. We could do the same thing with letters, which we actually did with, <coughs> with the origin of species. E would be A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and so on. And those would be taken from binary strings of length 26 or 27 or 28, depending on how many characters we have. <coughs> what about words? So consider the set of all words encountered in, in a data set. We'll call this our vocabulary. So let's order um, and index our vocabulary, vocabulary and represent words using one hot vectors. Like the above, okay? So we've got, um, so we're gonna say let word sub i equal, that's a bit messy, let word sub i equal the ith word in the vocabulary. So, <clears throat> for example, the word cat is, uh, can be written as a vector v, and <clears throat> it's in this vocabulary, uh, this vector space of vocabularies sorry, vector space representing the vocabulary. And it's zero, one, again, binary strings of length n, v. So that's the number of elements in our vocabulary. It's a sub, subspace of r, n, v. So in this case, how many words do we have? What's, what, how big do these one hot vectors have to be? So n, v is the number of words in our vocabulary. And there might be 70,000, let's say. So then if V uh, for <clears throat> the word cat, sorry, yeah, the word cat, the vector V is all zeros except for a one in the location corresponding to cat. Okay, <clears throat> so it's just a one hot encoding of a vocabulary of 70,000 or so words. This is nice, but when we're doing natural language processing, NLP, how do we handle the common situation in which different words can be used to, uh, to form a similar meaning? So, for example, I could say CS489 is interesting and represent each of those words using this uh, one hot vector vocabulary. Or I could say CS489 is fascinating. So those <clears throat> two sentences have similar meaning, but the encoding of interesting and fascinating would be different. It would be completely different one-hot vectors. How do we handle that? Well, we could form synonym groups, uh, but where do we draw the line when words have similar but not identical meanings? So, for example, um, I could have, we could say content, happy, um, elated, and ecstatic are all synonyms. But um, where do we draw the line? So should we have one for kind of, one category for kind of happy, one category for really happy, 
it's even it's better though if we could sort of reflect them on some sort of continuum <clears throat> these issues reflect the semantic relationship between words we would like to find a different representation for each word but one that also incorporates their semantics so those four words for happiness are actually on a continuum so i could go i could create a happiness scale and then i could say content is down here then i've got happy here over here is elated and over here is ecstatic how can we tease out the complex semantic relationships between words if we do want to put all of our words on this in some sort of continuum how do we go about doing it so let me um show you what people have done predicting word pairs we're look we're, we want to sort of tease out the statistics um, of word usage so what better place to look than what people have written when people write down words they're putting together a bunch of words that have meaning so we can sort of tease out meanings of words and relationships between words by looking at the co-occurrence of words that when words occur in, uh, when words occur close to each other. So we're going to be predicting word pairs. We can get a lot of information from the simple fact that some words often occur together or nearby in sentences. So for example, Trump returned to Washington Sunday night, um, though his wife Melania Trump stayed behind in Florida. So words that you'll often see together are like Trump and Washington, <clears throat> or Sunday night. Those are words that often come together. Um, Melania Trump are words that often go together. Another sentence. Human activity is degrading the landscape, driving species to extinction, and worsening the effects of climate change. So species and extinction uh, often occur together, I claim. Uh, human and activity often go together, or you know, you could say they show up together quite a lot. Climate and change. So these are showing words that are kind of linked semantically. So the purposes of this topic, we'll consider nearby to be within D words. So for example, if D equals two, then I'm if I if I focus on the word night, then I'm going to consider word pairs formed between night and all the other words in this group of five words. So for example, focusing on night, this gives me the word pairs Okay, quick joke. A surgeon is standing over a patient preparing him for surgery. And the surgeon says, it's okay, David, it's only a small procedure, you've got this. And the patient says, uh, my name's not David. And the surgeon says, I know, my name's David. <laughs> okay, so here's another example of D equals two. D equals two. <clears throat> so looking uh, centered on the, the word highlight in blue, um, you can see it forms the uh, word pairs. So for example, with this last example, fox. So fox and quick, fox and brown, jumps and over. Okay, so we can collect a whole bunch of word pairs from neighborhoods of words. What are we gonna do with those? So our approach is to try to predict these word co-occurrences using a three-layer neural network. The input is a one-hot word vector, just like I described before. And the output is the probability of each word's co-occurrence. So we input a word and we output the probability that all the other words occur nearby. Okay, so our neural network looks like this. So it's y equals f of v theta, where v is a, a one-hot word vector and y is a probability vector.
In other words, all the elements of P add up to one and they're all between zero and one. So then y i equals a probability that the word v is nearby. So v represented by this one hot vector. So here's a picture of the of the network. We have let's let me give some order here. Let's say we have cat, dog, fur, wood, a whole bunch of words, and then truck. So our V is basically a one hot vector here. So maybe um, it's cat. So cat, the cat node is on, all the others are off. <clears throat> there are n v of these, and now n v of the outputs. Now the outputs have the same order: cat, dog, fur, wood, truck. Now when you think of the output, which of those words is likely to co-occur with cat? I would say dog um, would <clears throat> occur sometimes. Probably fur occurs quite a bit. Probably not. Uh, we don't consider cat because uh, cat was the input. <clears throat> you wouldn't usually see cat cat. I guess you could say um, a cat with a cat. You might see the cat co-occur sometimes, but anyway. It's a bit beside the point. So each of this is a probability vector showing the likelihood or the estimated probability that each of those uh, words on the right occurs within D of the word on the left. And so in this case, uh, since it's a probability vector, we're probably going to use softmax, right? Okay, so <clears throat> this hidden layer is uh, squeezing. So it, we are going to, just like an autoencoder, it is an autoencoder. Well, it's very similar to an autoencoder. The hidden layer is going to squeeze the representation and force it to be a compressed representation. So this is going to require similar words to take on similar representations. So this is called an embedding. So you've probably heard me use that word embedding before. <clears throat> it's a latent representation or an embedding. And so it's a sort of a compressed representation of a, of a high dimensional input space. Because it's compressed, you, it has to sort of semantically organize the space. word 2 is a popular embedding strategy for words or phrases or sentences. It's, <clears throat> it uses additional tricks to speed up the learning. So it's a three layer sort of autoencoder type thing I showed you before. But since there's a, the, the input's high dimensional, the output's high dimensional, the, the hidden layer's often 300 or 500 dimensional. <clears throat> to speed up the learning, there, it uses some tricks. So let me just give you some insight into those tricks. First of all, it treats common phrases as new words. So for example, New York is one word. Okay, you can think of it as a word token. Secondly, it ignores very common words. Um, I think it randomly ignores common words. I don't know exactly what the, uh, what the mechanism is there. So I'll put randomly in brackets. So for example, the car hit the post on the curb. So we see the, the, the. And you can ask, is it really necessary to represent all those word pairs? There are actually 56, as to, according to my notes, there are 56 possible word pairs of that little sentence, but only 20 don't involve the word the. So you could argue that the word the carries sort of grammatical meaning, but not so much semantic meaning. So that's, that kind of justifies skipping those. Finally, negative sampling. They 
when you do your forward pass and you get your outputs, they're almost all close to zero. And so <clears throat> backpropping from those uh, zero elements is not necessarily that informative. So it backprops only some of the negative cases. So the embedding space is a relatively low dimensional space where similar inputs are mapped to similar locations. So where have we seen this before? MNIST autoencoder. Oops. MNIST autoencoder. So you might ask the question, why does this work? Why taking these one hot word vectors, pushing them through a uh, sort of a compressed layer and then expanding them back out to sort of predict what other words are in the neighborhood, why should we expect similar words or words with similar semantic meaning to be um, to have similar latent representations or similar uh, representations in the embedding space? So words with similar meaning will likely co-occur with the same set of words, right? So when, when we think of like what output, we have a particular input, we think of what output we want. Um, <clears throat> the words, um, let me flip that around. Let's consider consider two different words that give similar outputs. So they kind of they co-occur with the same sets of other words. Two different inputs, but similar output. To get similar output, their latent representation in the embedding space needs to be similar. So um, so two different words. As long as their <clears throat> their neighborhoods are are similar, then we should expect their latent representation in the embedding space to be similar. So let me write that out. Okay. So in this embedding space, in this latent space, the cosine angle is often used to measure the distance between two words. So if when you, you take a couple of different words, project them into the embedding space, and then you can look at how close they are in terms of what direction they're they're facing. So let me give you some examples. Let's say we have the word ball is represented by this vector here. Ball. And then we have kick down here. So I've shown them facing kind of in a similar direction because I'll call this theta one, the cosine of theta one according to my word to vec example, is 0 0.81. Now, so that <clears throat> in terms of cosine, uh, sort of the um, normalized cosine, well, the cosine it can be between minus one and plus one. So minus one means they're totally opposite, plus one means they're pointing in the same direction. So ball and kick are kind of close together. They're sort of pointing in the same direction. What about this one here, building? It's more or less orthogonal to ball. We'll call it theta two. Cosine of theta two is negative 0 0.05. And finally, this other one is uh, botanists. So this angle here, we'll call theta three, this theta is not uh, the connection weights or biases. This is just an angle. So different theta than, than the theta I mentioned previously in the lecture. Cosine of theta three is negative 0 0.36. So it's not quite facing the opposite direction. Oh, actually it's meant to be the angle, oh boy. this angle here. Okay. So what's kind of interesting in, in the semantic space, the embedding space, in this embedding space, there seems to be sort of semantic topology, just how I described how there's this happiness scale. If you kind of imagine that um, in more dimensions, that's kind of what you can do in this embedding space. So let me give you a, a <clears throat> um, let me give you a common example. Now it doesn't work like this for all examples, but it, 
you can sort of see that there's some logic in the embedding space. So let's say this vector here is king. I'm showing this in 3D, but of course the embedding space could be 300 dimensional. And this vector down here is man. <clears throat> now the vector from man to king is that vector. Now what if I started down here at woman, but added that vector to woman? Where do you think I should land? And would you think it's pretty cool if I land at queen? My colors are a bit messed up. Um, I don't have the same pen colors as I had when I first made these notes. But I think you get the idea. So you can do some sort of um, vector addition and subtraction in this embedding space to some extent. So king minus man plus woman equals something like queen. <clears throat> so that's pretty cool. So let me show you very quickly um, this in action. So you can download word to vec you can download pre-trained models. <clears throat> um, you have to get this uh, gen sim thing. So if I go ahead and run this, you can read in a corpus of text. And this line here will train the, the model. Uh, but I'm not going to train it. This <clears throat> on my computer would take uh, about 10 minutes or so, uh, some amount of time, not a crazy amount of time, but it's, I don't want to do it now. So I've pre-trained it and I'll just read in the model. So how many words are in our vocabulary? In this case, 71,290. Um, this corpus, I think, comes from uh, Wikipedia. They sort of export a whole bunch of Wikipedia pages just as simplified text. The window size that was used was five. So that means it's making word pairs out of windows of length five. So I showed you D equals two before. So you go two words this way, two words that way. We're going five words. So it's a total sort of neighborhood of, of length 11, if you like. <clears throat> okay, so let's try using the model. So you can actually get the vector this is the vector for man. It, it's not displayed very nicely here. I can make the window a bit wider. Um, no, that's not working. Let me do this instead. So it's a 300 vector uh, because this model, this, this size here would have given the size of the uh, embedding space. So I chose 300. And so this is a 300 vector. I won't uh, go back down and uh, I won't make the font small again. Um, <clears throat> and you can measure the similarity between two words. So man and woman have a, a, a cosine. Um, the cosine of the angle between those two vectors is 0.675. And you can actually compute it. You can take the vectors themselves and take the dot product and divide by the norms of the two vectors and you get the same number. And so we can try some vector operations. You can say, well, you can say what's the similarity between ball and kick. So these are the things I just wrote in the in the notes before. Uh, this is where I got these numbers from ball building. Um, well, I gave you a different number in the, in the lecture notes, but it's because I, I guess I was using a different trained model. Every time you train it, you'll get slightly different embedding space, right? Botanist is minus 0.3-ish. <clears throat> so you can ask for what words are nearby ball. Kick, Q, as in cue ball, batter, snap. So it just looks through all the different words and finds the ones that have the closest uh, cosine uh, distance or the biggest cosine value, I guess. What about interesting? Unusual, obvious, important. Um, Strangely, the, the word fascinating is not in there, but that's okay. So you can do this sort of vector algebra as well. So similar by vector. So I'm gonna give it the vector for him, subtract her, but add she. So this is like the 
king minus man plus woman equals queen. So him minus her plus she. So you can ask yourself, what's the, going from her to him is the same as going from she to he. You can ask, uh, which of these words doesn't match? Breakfast, truck, milk, cereal. So truck, I'm not sure what that warning is. Don't worry about it. Truck. So some more of these things. Um, freezing to hot is the same as cool to, I would say warm. So hot and cool are already in those three, but warm is the next one that's not in there. Walk to run is the same as slow to fast. <clears throat> Branch to hand is the same as twigs to, I'll give you a second to think about that. If the branch is like a hand, then the twigs are like the fingers. This one you've already seen. The relationship of woman to queen is the same as the relationship from man to king or prince. And finally, the relationship from eye to camera is the same as ear to microphone. So these are hand-picked examples. They don't all work out quite that nicely. Um, but I'll put this, um, this code online and you can play with it and see if you can find some interesting sort of uh, semantic linear algebra relationships. But this video is all about vector embeddings, taking a large um, input space that has a lot of semantic relationships in it and compressing it into compressing it into a lower dimensional embedding space where the compressed representation forces a kind of organization, a semantic organization in that space. So whenever you want to do some, like, let's say, natural language processing, instead of feeding the words into your network as one hot vectors, it's common to practice to first take those words, put them into this, this semantically organized embedding space, uh, let's say 300 dimensions, take that 300 vector and put that into your natural language processing um, neural network.